All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, I'm pleased today to introduce uh, Jenny Lee, who is a vice chair of the Unicode Emoji Subcommittee, graduated from the college herself, and is back in Cambridge today to talk with us all about emoji. So please join me in welcoming Jenny Lee. Thank you. I stand. So here is good. So a fun fact, Professor and Malin and I actually were in the same class at Harvard. And I actually took CS50 as a uh, freshman because I was an applied math and economics major. But at that point, it's, it was not like the lifestyle brand that it has since become. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely appreciate like all the bells and whistles and the fact that we now get free pizza and like lots of live streaming. So uh, David, uh, I guess saw, I guess maybe he saw a Jimmy Kimmel appearance I, I had on Emoji and asked me to come speak. So I'm going to give you sort of a fun overview of like, how does an emoji become an emoji? Um, so I'm going to start the story with uh, my friend, whose name is Ying Lu, who is a designer very well known for having designed a Twitter fail whale. And she's Chinese Australian. I'm Chinese uh, American. And we were you know, texting about dumplings, because that is what Chinese-ish women do <laughs> with each other. And so I texted her uh, you know, this photo of dumplings that I was cooking and she was like, yum, 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 fried dumplings, you know, yay, knife and fork, knife and fork. And then, she, then she's like, I'm surprised that Apple doesn't have a dumpling emoji. And I was like, oh, huh, good point. And then like, you know, that would probably have been the end of anything because, you know, many conversations just sort of end on the like surprise that something doesn't exist. But half an hour later, uh, on my screen <laughs> pops like, this dumpling with blinking eyes. You don't actually get the whole full effect of like the bling bling dumpling um, uh, that she had created. And she had decided to design her own dumpling emoji because she was a designer and she's like, I can fix this. And I was really kind of startled when I discovered there was no dumpling emoji, right? Because like I knew that emoji were originally Japanese and that's why there are a lot of Japanese foods on the keyboard, right? Um, so, you know, there's ramen, there's the bento box, there's curry, there's tempura. They're like kind of a bunch of weird Japanese foods. Like, I think these are like, fi I've seen this on the streets of Japan. I think they're like fishy things on a stick. Uh, this is a Oden. fish cake. What is it called? Oden. Oden, yeah. They have, and it's, they're fishy things, right? On a stick, um, <laughs> basically. I mean, and there's even like the whole like rice ball that looks like it's had a bikini wax. Um, and. So, but there was no dumpling emoji, which I thought was very strange because like, if you think about it, dumplings are a universal food. Like every country has their version of a dumpling, like it's you know, empanada or pierogi or, um, you know, uh, palmini or like even ravioli is a form of dumpling. Like essentially like there's this universal truth of yummy goodness inside a carbo carbohydrate shell that basically every culture has discovered. Um, so I was like, okay, dumplings are universal, and of course, emoji are universal. And the fact that therefore there wasn't a dumpling emoji told me whatever system in place was like basically broken. So I was like, I'm gonna go fix this. I had like no idea where emoji came from, but I was like a woman on a mission to find herself her dumpling emoji. So I was like, who controls emoji? Knew nothing about it, but you know, yay Google. And so you very quickly <laughs> you get to the website, and I did, of the Unicode Consortium which is a nonprofit organization based in Mountain View, California, who has, uh, at that point, I discovered 12 full voting members, nine of which were US multinational tech companies. So this was in late 2005 when I started going down the rabbit hole. So these companies, the nine, were things like Oracle and IBM and Microsoft, Adobe, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Yahoo. Of the three that were not US multinational tech companies, <coughs> they were uh, a German company, SAP, the Chinese company Huawei, which no one had heard of back then, but like a lot of people have heard of now, um, and then the government of Oman. Right. So these were the, these were the twelve <laughs> full voting members who paid eighteen thousand dollars a year to vote on emoji, and I was like kind of horrified by this, like the sort of like you know tech cabal plus Oman. Um, so, so. I was like very indignant. First of all, and I also discovered like $18,000 times like 12. It wouldn't take that much money to take over the Unicode consortium. <laughs> but um, luckily, there's like this tiny little loophole, which is that you can join as an individual for $75. Uh, no voting, voting power, but you get to show up at the meetings and you get added to their mailing list. So, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, like I like, you know, paid my $75 online. 
uh, using a credit card and like became a Unicode member, like joined the you know email, and I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm on a mission, and um, and so they had. Uh, they had these meetings, and so you know you're on the email list, and they send out this RSVP request and said, "Who's going to come to the next meeting?" You know, it was like in October, I think, or November. I looked at my calendar, and I was like, "I will be in the Bay Area at that time," and I like RSVP back. I'm like, "I will come," and I don't completely know what I was expecting. Um, so essentially, I maybe like a little Congress, like a very mini Congress or something. But I took my, you know, I got on public transit and it showed, went to the Apple headquarters. This was in Sunnyvale, and. You know, I, I don't know, maybe I thought it was like there would be like 100 people, maybe like the number of people in this room, but sort of like more neatly organized and sort of a, you know, a Nancy Pelosi kind of style like arc. Um, but it is not what I found. Uh, this is the room where people decide. These are the people who decide your emoji. Uh, these were, this is a photo from the November uh, 2015. Um, and it was really weird because, first of all, they were super excited to see me because they have, most of these people have been working together for like 25 years and like, new people don't just like randomly show up. Um, and um, they're like, you know, tell us about yourself, what brings you here, we're so happy to see you. And it totally had the vibe of like a new church, like really, <laughs> really, really nice old white people. And so <laughs> the, the, the sort of group, you know, they were basically mostly male, mostly engineers, um, mostly older. And you know, one of them even had a daughter that had made him a shirt that said shadowy emoji overlord. This is the chair of the Unicode emoji subcommittee and the president of Unicode, uh, Mark Davis. So um, they just sort of were debating about emoji, you know, things like milk. Should it be a glass of milk? Should it be a bottle of milk? Should it be a carton of milk? Because cartons aren't universal. You know, then there was like, so, you know, kind of big debate about milk. And then there was like this question about beans. Red beans, green beans, black beans, like which bean should we choose? And there was like paralysis over the color of beans. So there's no bean emoji. If you haven't noticed, there is a glass of milk emoji. And I was like, this system is like clearly broken <laughs> and like I'm going to go fix it. So um, I created a group. It's called Emoji Nation, whose motto is emoji by the people for the people. So it was me and, you know, my friend Ying from way back when. And um, and then you know our you know our motto is more inclusive and representative emoji you know starting with a dumpling which was our mission to begin with so you know started this campaign we're going to get the dumpling emoji and made a kickstarter video um, and the dumpling emoji project i think dumplingemoji.org is still alive and i think okay does the video work and we made this video dumplings are one of the most universal cross-cultural foods in the world Georgia has kinkali, Japan has gyoza, Korea has mandu, Italy has ravioli, Poland has pierogi, Russia has pelmeni, Argentina has empanadas, Jewish people have kreplech, China has potstickers, Nepal and Tibet have momos. Yet somehow, despite their popularity, there is no dumpling emoji in the standard set. Why is that? Emoji exists for pizza, tempura, sushi, spaghetti, hot dog, and now tacos, which Taco Bell takes credit for. We need to write this disparity. Dumplings are global. Emoji are global. Isn't it time we brought them together? Oh yeah, and while we're at it, how about an emoji for Chinese takeout? So, you know, you know, kind of raise like, I think, uh, we raised like $12,000 so that we could join the Unicode Consortium. And so Emoji Nation became a member. And you know, wrote I wrote my little emoji proposal with a you know a bunch of us all kind of dumpling lovers together, and uh, we we got it passed in January of 2016. So this is Yiying, with um, you know a mysterious. This was the, and then the other co-chair of the emoji subcommittee from Apple, who like who they 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 roll anonymously at Apple, but uh, there he is. And um, so these were our original sets. So along with dumpling, we did takeout box and chopsticks and then fortune cookie. And to be honest, I don't think fortune cookie would have like gotten in on its own merits, but on the sort of coattails of dumpling and takeout box and chopsticks, it kind of made it. And so it took a couple, you know, a while. These are the ones now on Apple. Like very photorealistic, like, like dumpling, I have to say, like totally weird, like dead Pac-Man interpretation of um, the fortune cookie on the half of the eye. Like, first of all, there's like no mouth and no thing. It's like totally like some kind of dead three-dimensional um, Pac-Man. 
so, you know, it kind of got me into this like deep, deep, deep rabbit hole of like, well, how does an emoji become an emoji? And it is actually like a really weird uh, process. So, you know, first of all, let's say you have an idea. And, and this is what's really nice. Anyone can submit an emoji proposal. So you have your idea uh, and then you write a proposal and you submit it to the emoji subcommittee, which kind of talks about it. And sometimes they'll kick it back to you. Um, and you kind of go around and around the circle, you know, they'll have feedback, they don't like your design, they don't think your statistics are good. It's like very, th these meetings are really funny because they're kind of like C-SPAN, but like around emoji. And um, the emoji subcommittee then, uh, you know, at a certain point when it's good, it'll kick it to the full committee. Um, so factors for inclusion, like what kinds of things does the committee care about? So things, uh, you know, if it's popular demand, frequently requested, um, which they, interestingly enough, kind of use like how many times the term appears on like Google search or YouTube or for a while there was Instagram hashtags as a way of like measuring demand. And this is also just like the general disease of like engineers, which is they love to measure things and, and, uh, they, and if it can't be measured, they sometimes can't value it, and which is kind of interesting, right? Because they always want to try to map like the world into like metrics. Um, and you know, one can have these very extensive debates of whether or not you know demand can be measured through like whether or not the term appears um, in Google or in YouTube. But uh, the kind of pluses for multiple usage and meanings. So like fox, like it can mean both fox and you know like a kind of like wily or sly or an owl can mean like um, can mean. Uh, wise or a skunk can mean smelly um, and then one of the necessary things it has to be able to like kind of appear um, distinct at little emoji sizes and then there is um, sort of sometimes a value in terms of like filling a gap or completeness so for a while there the only we had hearts were red yellow green blue purple white maybe maybe white and black but we didn't have orange so then we um, you know orange really kind of like orange the orange heart actually kind of slid in there basically because like all the other hearts are there but like bizarrely orange heart was missing um factors against uh emoji inclusion are basically too specific too narrow so like a very specific kind of dog as opposed to dogs in general um redundant so like a good example there was we had a um proposal like one of the turkey companies they wanted a roast turkey but we already had a live turkey so we just decided like both of them basically can mean thanksgiving so like you don't need two forms of turkey cooked and not cooked though we do have two forms of chicken cooked and not cooked we have all actually the whole life cycle of a chicken i don't know if you've ever noticed we have like the egg the egg in like a little like you know shell i mean sorry egg then the chicken a shell chick by itself full chicken then cooked chicken <laughs> and then if you really want to complete we also have poo at the end smiling poo at the end and then this is key actually no lo logos brands deities and celebrities so this really confuses people they're like why can't we get the coke can or why can't we get like the nike swoosh and basically because you can't because there's like all kinds of ip issues uh so no deities either so no like no buddha no muhammad no 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 deities uh no ganesh you know um and when you hear about like kim mojis like those are not really emoji, they're essentially stickers. But so that's really key. Like these, once an emoji, always an emoji. They kind of look for longevity. Um, and so once it kind of gets out of the subcommittee, it gets get kicked to the full committee, the full Unicode Technical Committee. Those are the people that were in the room. And then uh, three times, sorry, four times a year they meet. And then each one of those, they kind of you know vote to pass a set of emoji for like um, provisional or basically candidate they're candidates at that point and so you know four times a year they kind of like vote on ones that will become candidates and then once a year as a whole batch they vote and those get selected uh, for the next year so it takes actually a pretty long time um, and the, so once a year they lock the emoji and once it's locked it goes through all the different like you know vendors like Google and Apple and they have to start basically adding it into just you know all the software all the designs lots of things happen very they keep on telling us it's very very expensive to get these emoji passes so these are all like companies with like billions of dollars on their uh, on their sort of books so I don't I'm not super sympathetic when they're like you know five more emoji is like overwhelming for their folks so then uh, those kind of then show up on your phone and laptops for Apple 
Um, most of the updates happen in November, like late October, November. I think we just, if you guys have updated your iOS devices, because they're like Apple's very persistent in like making you <laughs> update your device, you will have seen the, the latest generation for the 2019 emoji. So, ta da, that is how it becomes an emoji. It takes about 18 to 24 months. So, when I first proposed my dumpling emoji, it was like, like my first got my idea in September, October, like September of 2015. I proposed it in January of 2016, and it hit the phone in November-ish, October-ish of 2017. So very, very long time. It's a very, 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 very long time. Um, so, you know, emoji nation, like you know, it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing, you know, just like the whole video thing. But we we kind of like went on a little crusade uh, to help kind of pass a bunch of inclusive and representative emojis. So we like to think of ourselves as the voice of the people uh, in the room that matters. So. Um, so one of the interesting things is like, why does Unicode, this like, you know, consortium cabal thing, uh, control emoji? So part of it is uh, sort of a natural accident of just what Unicode does to give you some history. Um, you know, there are sort of debates about when emoji started, but essentially it started in Japan sometime in the late 1990s. You know, there's a SoftBank collection, a, a Docomo collection. This one is sort of the famed kind of like, ooh, it's all in color. Um, and was introduced in 1999, probably created, I think, in 97, and super, so famous that they are, they were collected, this is very funny, as in the Museum of Modern Art collected the emoji as part of their permanent collection, which is, of course, very strange if you think about it, because they're, they're just images, so there's nothing to, <laughs> there's nothing to collect or told, but from a museum perspective, it's actually a lot of collecting of digital property has a lot to do with the um, IP rights and be able to recreate and create them, you know, and all kinds of stuff. So um, what happened then was in about 2007, so emoji were incredibly popular in Japan, and at a certain point, um, you know, all the phones and all, you know, across all the different carriers had their own little versions of emoji, and then what happened was uh, Gmail landed basically in Japan. And people would would you know send their emoji using Gmail on their phones, but of course Gmail couldn't capture um, the emojis because these were just proprietary systems. So you would like have this kind of weird situation where like these these symbols would get lost as you kind of moved between you know email and the phones, and then of course then all the phones had their different versions, and so. Um, essentially, Google and some others kind of went to Unicode and said, can you please help us kind of coordinate this? Because essentially, what is Unicode's mission? This sometimes gets lost in all the late night you know, television shows, but Unicode has a very interesting mission. It's to enable everyone speaking every language on the earth to be able to use their language on their computer or smart, or smartphones. And they um, you know, basically see it as a form of human right because if you cannot communicate with your language in the digital era, it essentially will become extinct. So um, it's kind of interesting because you know they started with, you know, back in uh, way back when with like encoding like Russian and Arabic, and you know the second generation was like Chinese, which was a little bit hard. Chinese, Japanese, and Korean were a little harder. And then you kind of like worked <laughs> their way down. You, know, you got to like hieroglyphics. Now they're they're basically at a lot of minority languages, um, and sometimes like dead languages right now. So they have three main projects. This is kind of key. I know that everyone pays attention to emoji. That's kind of what I kind of came down the rabbit hole with. So they encode characters, including emoji. Now there are over 100,000 characters encoded. Um, that's like what everyone is, uh, knows them for. But from a practical perspective, if you are a computer science person, they actually have two <laughs> other things that are very important. So they have localization resources, which is um, known as the Common Locale Data Repository, also known as CLDR. So that tells you, like, you know, does the month, in this country, does the date format work, you know, uh, month, month, year, month, month, date, no, no, MMDD, Y, 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 or is it like, you know, DD, MM, Y, 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 you know, or is it a 24-hour clock, or is it, you know, so all kinds of locality information gets stored um, in these sort of localized resources, including all the various names for the emoji in the various different languages. They also have um, programming languages, uh, programming libraries to do all of this stuff, and that's called the International Components for Unicode, or ICU. And so what's really funny is CLDR is the name, this is what they call it. Most people actually don't even, I, I had to Google to figure out what the, what the whole name is because we just call it CLDR. And so very funny, I guess like some guy's girlfriend or something 
misheard seal deer, and so she was like, "What's a seal deer?" And so she made him a little seal deer for <laughs> when once so this this is like very operated on this poor stuffed animal had all kinds of surgery that are like it's like really problematic. So he, he he you know she made him a little seal deer, um, and this has become sort of the unofficial mascot of like that part of Unicode. Um, so it, you know, they introduced, uh, so they started the proposal in 2007. It actually took into 2010 to introduce the first generation of emoji, Unicode 6.0. They just like had a bunch of the emoji, including you know, one of our lovely, I think poo emoji, smiling poo emoji is among, is among this. So they basically took all of the um, you know, different versions of the emoji from the different carriers and tr basically tried to reconcile them. Not of, all of which were like completely reconcilable, uh, but like whatever. So like one of the weird examples is, uh, you know, one Japanese carrier had like women with bunny ears as like a portrait shot, so just one woman, and that was sort of I think on the Android side. Then separately on whoever Apple was working with had like two women in bunny bunny ears, like total full body. So like clearly bunny ears are important in Japan, but those those got matched to each other even though they're obviously very different once you send them back and forth, but whatever. So these were the original ones. Um, and what is, you know, how does encoding work? So basically, for those of you who may remember one of the first lectures, I don't know, David sent me his uh, lecture notes, but you know, basically a Unicode code point is a unique number assigned to each Unicode character. So each character gets one little piece of Unicode real estate. Um, you know, this uh, face with tears of joy, so with tears tears of joy. Uh, this is its little Unicode like code point. Um, if you, in you know, hexadecimal, if you translate to hexadecimal, it ends up being this number, and if you translate to binary, it looks like that number. So those are all the same uh, as they kind of like move through whatever like uh, parser is interpreting all the emoji. So, you know, they kind of land in 2010 and I don't know, if we talk to the original emoji proposers, they don't necessarily think anything big was gonna happen because they encode kind of like characters all the time, right? Like little, you know, like poker, like for um, when you play cards and when you play chess, they, and then you wing ding. So it wasn't like that big a deal to just add this, this sort of set of images into the Unicode library. But then Apple decided to kind of basically put a keyboard um, the emoji keyboard onto our phones, and then suddenly you can see, you kind of basically see where like emoji was kind of hanging out, and then iOS decided to add, um, uh, you know, the key or make the keyboard more accessible with emoji, and then boop, 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 and there it goes. That is the rising popularity of emoji all the time. So again, anyone can submit to, uh, <laughs> to Unicode, docsubmit at unicode.org. My friend Rick kind of oversees that. It's a very funny account to get things at. So, you know, kind of proposals we've helped pass. This is Rayouf Alhumedi, who is um, who is a 15-year-old girl when she decided she wanted a hijab emoji, and so she wrote in, and we helped. She actually got into Harvard, but she was Stan Stanford, but we will forgive her for that. So she's now at Stanford, and as, as I say, like you can come to the Unicode meetings now um, on the ones that happen on a quarterly basis. Um, so that was her original proposal when it first came over. And I was super excited. Then there was, I have a group of friends in Argentina who really were, went all out for the mate emoji, which actually just showed up. I think that should have showed up on your um, phones this year. I mean, they were, this was like national news, like the largest, or not the largest, but like the most prestigious paper, La Nación in uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina, uh, had a full page Sunday article <laughs> about their like campaign for the mate emoji. Um, very weirdly, we also had this, group, sort of a girls advocacy group that wanted a menstruation emoji, which I, 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 I get, I get. Uh, but of course they like proposed bloody underwear, which is like a terrible emoji for all kinds of reasons. So I was like, ugh. And so we convinced them to do blood drop so that, you know, menstruation, you can moon and blood drop calendar and a blood drop. We even got them sort of briefs and a blood drop. Um, so, you know, who, like I said, who can propose emoji? All kinds of people. So skin tones, you know, those wonderful skin tones that you see that kind of change the emoji everywhere. Uh, those were actually proposed by a, a mom out of Texas uh, named Katrina Parrott, uh, just a mom. Like her daughter came home one day and was like, you know, I'd really like to see myself represented in emoji. 
And then her mom was like, that's great, honey. What's an emoji? You know, and once she found out, <laughs> she works in procurement. So um, I think she worked for NASA. And, and so like she can handle paperwork. Like she can handle bureaucracy. So a lot of that goes to, to her credit, a woman named Katrina Parrott. Like this is not like, you know, the, the white men and the white nerdy men in the room in, in uh, Mountain View or Sunnyvale coming up with skin tones. Um, so Women's Flat Shoe, if you guys have, have seen this ballet flat, that was sort of a reaction by, um, from a mom of four, oh, no, actually, wait, let's see. She, the, the person who, who also worked on that also got a one-piece bathing suit because um, she was really bothered by the fact the only form of skin wear was, a, you know, itsy, bitsy, teeny, polka dot, yellow polka dot bikini. Um, <laughs> like obviously like weirdly overtly sexualized and so it was actually done by a mom of like three now four girls so when i met her she had three now she has four when she had spent many many years um pregnant and breastfeeding and was like not wearing heels and so up until that point all the heels on the keyboard uh sorry all the shoes women's shoes all had heels right sandals had heels boots had heels everything had heels stilettos had heels so um, that is now we can we have her to sort of thank. She got a lot of press out of it in part because she is a PR person um, and just like random people. There's like this German who wanted like you know what we call the Colbert emoji, like you know. <laughs> so he like wrote it in you know on LaTeX and like it got passed. Then governments we had the actually literally the Finnish equivalent of the State Department propose a sauna emoji, which is like terrible. Like first of all, these these are very. <laughs> very sad, naked <laughs> people with club feet. Um, so it was from, yes, it was the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. So they, they proposed this. We kind of helped shape it into like maybe a little bit like more clear. And it was, you know, the women's with the spoon and then wearing a towel, a little bit more modest, but like very bizarrely in a translation of like telephone, which is emoji. It just basically became person in a steamy room. So it's like basically, I don't know, have you seen these? It's like person coming out of a shower, essentially. That was originally, uh, so this is the morphing <laughs> that, uh, that happened in the sort of whole Unicode proposal game. Um, so, um, you, know, one, you know, why do I care about emoji? So one of the reasons I grew up speaking Chinese, uh, and that gives you a very interesting perspective on emoji, right? Because, you know, if you think about it, like, in some ways, Chinese are the original form of emoji, along with hieroglyphics. You know, and these are these are actually you know fire. fire. This is like fire way back when. That's a modern fire character, and then of course the fire emoji. This is mouth. You know, there's, um, you know, looks very mouth-like. There's tree or wood, um, and then moon, and then sun. Right? These are all. You know, you can kind of see this universality of objects that have been depicted, um, both. You know, you know, whether or not in the Shang Dynasty or now in the form of like colorful little glyphs on your iPhone. Um, and what's kind of really fun about like Chinese characters, you can like start mixing and matching all the little things. So for example, you have two trees, you basically have a forest. Oops. Ta da! You know, um, if you take Ming, this character, this is. Uh, basically, you take a sun and a moon together, and it basically means bright. Ta -da. Um, but you get more fun. Like so, here is, and he, and he kind of like can see the psychology of a culture. So this is basically a roof with a pig. So the, that lower creature is a pig. It's a roof. So you're like, oh, maybe it's like a farm, maybe you know, or like a barn. But no, this actually means cha means home. This is, or, or family. So basically, home is where your pigs are, which I think says a lot about China at that time. So another fun one. Oh, super fun. So this character, radical, means woman or girl. And you could, you know, maybe it's like, like she's like curtsying or like whatever. So all, use all kinds of ways in, in Chinese characters. So this is my favorite one. Again, we have the roof, we have the woman. So you're like, oh, roof and woman. Like, maybe means home or means family, right? Like, you know, but actually, no, it actually means um, peace. So an means peace. So like things are at peace when the woman is under a roof at home <laughs> or whatever. So uh, 
you know, very similarly, you have the woman, you have the kid or boy, depending on baby boy. Uh, if you put all of those together, you're like, oh, maybe that also means family, but no, it means good. So our standard for good is a woman with a baby boy. Um, uh, so that, uh, all kinds of like issues about that. Um, and you know, all kinds of combinations as radical shows up in Chinese. So what three women together means evil or wicked. Um, so very like Macbethy, like whatever. And this character means greedy. This character means slave. This character means jealous. Uh, this character means like to betray or you know, adultery. I mean, very loosely uh, interpreted can be adultery. So you're like, oh, you know, like, and, and growing up as like, you know, your little six year old learning your characters, not like the adultery character at that point, but you know, you're like, this is, you know, kind of subliminally kind of sending all kinds of messages to my little like, you know, developing brain. But there were, all, there were also all kinds of issues with emoji in that way, right? So until 2016, there are many ways you could be a man in a job on your emoji keyboard. You could be a policeman, you could be a detective, you could be a Buckingham Palace guard, you can be Santa Claus, you can be Santa Claus in all kinds of colors, you can be Santa Claus. But until 2015 or 2016, there were only four things you could be as a woman on the emoji keyboard. So they were princess, bride, dancer, and playboy bunny. So those were those were those were our jobs, <laughs> right? So like clearly like all kinds of issues, all you know, Japan, like whatever. This is like so problematic. And um, so what's interesting is we can now talk about the power of combining emoji. So it turns out a lot of the emoji on your keyboard actually aren't uh, assigned code points. They're actually like a bunch of emoji kind of squished together. So skin tones are one of those examples. Like sometimes if you send something to an old, like someone with an old phone or sometimes like Gmail, you'll see like emojis start breaking apart. Um, so you'll get, so essentially they're, they're skin tones, but they're usually the yellow person with like a little square um, uh, after it based on the Fitzpatrick scale of skin tones, which kind of has to do with skin cancer very oddly. But um, we also have this idea of zwidge, which stands for zero with joiner. Very interestingly, kind of mostly used in, in like languages like Arabic, where you want to kind of glue characters together. Sometimes you'll see them in English, where you have um, like an F and an L, and they're kind of glued into a very nice like ligature. That kind of invisible F Lness um, is often sometimes this zero with joiner. So. We glue things all together. You put rainbow and a flag, and you get a rainbow flag. Actually, it's actually I think the other way around. It's a flag, then a rainbow. You get rainbow flag. Um, and actually, a lot of the women we, we like worked really hard. Google gets a lot of credit for this. Um, these occupations are oftentimes, almost always, actually a female character or a male character plus something after it. So the astronaut is a woman plus the spaceship, you know, and then. The, um, the doctor, sorry, not the doctor, the chef is like a woman plus like, I think the fry, I think it's a frying egg. Um, so th those are creation of these like the zwidgy, the zwidginess of, you know, farmer, food service, education, all of these. I like the one to the laptop. That one's like really fun. I have a lot of people who use that in their like Twitter handle or Instagram handle. Um, the other really interesting thing, I'm very proud of this, is if you guys have updated your phones and you have iPhones, uh, you'll notice suddenly you can have like interracial or multiracial people holding hands at this point. And those are also zwidge Very There's a lot of characters going on like when you're creating, creating um, the people holding hands. Um, wait, let's skip this. So we actually had worked with Tinder, yes, Tinder, to do a proposal on interracial couple emoji which was super fun and they care in part because I think studies have shown that, and they're like real studies, like academic studies, not just like, you know, marketing studies, that as online dating uh, appears in the community, the rates of uh, interracial marriage go up. So they're like, they're like, ooh. Um, and so now I think it's very cute. There's a new interface. We're very interested to see, there was like a combinatoric explosion of all of these creatures is like very, very high. So, so uh, I, was, I was really excited to see how they did that. Um, did I see an ad? Oh no, okay, there was a full page ad in the New York Times somewhere, but I must have like cut that out in my slides. Oh well. Um, so for Emoji Nation, here's a sample of some of the emoji we've done. This doesn't include the most recent ones because I've not updated my Mac OS, so 
Um, some of the ones that you've seen, like the mate emoji and the blood drop are not on here, but you know, it gives you a sense of like the fun that we had. We did a whole bunch with uh, GE, the science emoji, like DNA and you know, Petri dish and microbe. I'm very proud of like the toilet paper emoji. My friend is super excited about that. Uh, lobster, we got the, we actually had a very strong supportive um, letter from Senator Angus King on behalf of the lobster. Uh, especially given the, the other crustacean kind of representation that was already on the keyboard through crabs and shrimp, that the lobster also needed to be represented. In. Bagel, that was like my way of saying like Jewish without like the Star of David um, on behalf of my Jewish friends. Uh, and these are some of the people who have contributed, who, which is very different than the room that you saw in the beginning. So it's super fun. You can join us on our Slack. And then, you know, just sort of some interesting stats that with this month, maybe last month, last month. Um, Unicode actually released for the first time um, the frequency of use. So this is, it's really funny. It's kind of interesting. So it's like, it's like tiered and it's in log two, which I thought was very Unicode. So, so in theory, like the, you know, the ones in one are used half as much as the ones in level zero and then two half as much as the ones in level one, da, 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 all the way down. And so one of the most fascinating things, I do not know how this is possible, but essentially Basis with tears of joy by itself is like 10% of all emoji usage, <laughs> according. So you can see it goes from face with tears of joy, then the heart is really big, then heart eyes, then laughing, so and then the hands, and then it just kind of goes all the way down. Um, it's really fun. It's definitely worth kind of looking because it, it makes you like wonder a little bit about like like who and why are people using all these emoji. So. You know, it's a sort of question like, what is the future of emoji? Unicode doesn't want to be in the world of regulating emoji. It's like not really what it's designed to be doing. Um, so I have a friend who is a professor at Stanford who is pushing, you know, he thinks it's a terrible idea for Unicode to be regulating. And he and me, you know, because I always like, you know, saying my name in LaTeX, um, did a proposed something back in 2016, which is the idea that maybe the encoding should not be kind of managed by a central regulatory body, but instead, you know, you, for the little images, you do a hash and then the, you know, a standard hash and then the, you know, that generates a, a sequence of numbers and then you look at those, that sequence of numbers and you pass that back and forth. Um, of course, then you need a central repository what those numbers are, yada, 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 whatever. So then there's another one uh, that we just introduced this year by Mark did this, which is very interesting, actually. I don't know if this will fly. I, I do find it very interesting. It's basically using what are known as QID numbers, which I did not know were the numbering system that's used in Wikipedia. So everything in Wikipedia apparently has, is like numbered uh, and it has a QID number. And what that does is it, it kind of unites things like there's one Barack Obama page, right? But sorry, there's one Barack Obama QID, but he has pages in like Spanish and Russian and Chinese and Indonesian and whatever. So, so it kind of all reconciles. It's very funny because I think like one is like the universe and like two is earth. Like they, they're very, very methodical in, in like their, their sense of humor in terms of numbering things. So one thing would be to, can we use these QID numbers that are in the Wikipedia numbering system as a way of sort of um, flexibly but standardized way of like encoding things back and forth? I don't know. I hear, I think our friends are Facebook or sort of like, or WhatsApp folks are kind of like not into this idea, but I think it's really interesting. Um, and then, you know, what emoji are we working on? If you have questions, I'll. I'll tell you, and then that's me, ta-da. So you can reach me at like Jenny at emojicon.co or Jenny at emojination.org. Those are the same. Is that it? And how am I in time? I'm good? Ta-da. And if you really want, if we want to play, we can also play emoji spelling bee <laughs> later, which is sort of my, my way. I just did a whole, I did my first emoji spelling bee in Hong Kong, which is super fun. I can teach you guys how to play. So Q, Q and A? Yes, no? Done. Yay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't like people clap. I have no idea. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> so, are there questions? We could play emoji spelling bee if not. Yes. Yeah, okay, so the question is like, how do the vendors or the different platforms do their thing independently of like what Unicode tells them to do? Um, so Unicode is, so when Unicode encodes like uh, 
bagel emoji, it's equivalent of encoding like a capital letter B, right? So it does not actually say what the B should look like. It gives a guidance image. Um, but then like the platforms run off and do like kind of what the, whatever they want to do. And sometimes that causes all kinds of issues because like sometimes it's facing left, sometimes it's facing right, sometimes it's an animal's head, sometimes it's the animal's body. Um, and so that has caused much annoyance everywhere. And so there is sort of an effort to coordinate behind this. The designers um, have their own little mailing list so that they can coordinate um, and at least have some consistency. So this was an issue most recently with razor was the thing that was passed and a, the mi original image was a straight edge razor, razor which I was like, eh, that's like not super gender inclusive. So we, we were pushing them to do the, the plastic razor. I don't know what you call it, but you know, like the kind that you can both like use on your face and then, you know, use uh, on your legs. Um, you know, one of the most famous examples of like one platform going rogue is when Apple decided to take the gun emoji and make it into a squirt gun, and of course, confusing like everything everywhere for a while. Uh, but very interestingly enough, like all the other platforms moved to um, the a, a children's gun emoji as well. And so it's, it's kind of interesting because in some ways you can see that the platforms, what they want or decide is like okay or not okay, kind of can get through. So like marijuana emoji or cannabis leaf emoji, we probably have had like five to seven proposals, some of them very good. You know, it kind of hits a lot of, uh, you know, the factors like distinct shape, does it have a meaning, is it probably demand, yes, 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 yes. And everyone's like, nope, like we're not gonna do this one. You know, and, and uh, you know, cause they're all like whatever family friendly companies uh, who have like vested interests like all around the world. Um, including cultures that are much more conservative. So one little fun fact is many of the alcohol emoji are not actually the alcohol. They are uh, the container for the alcohol. So it's a wine glass emoji. It is not a wine emoji. It's a beer mug emoji, not beer. And that was sort of done out of concern of the, of, of like that the Muslim countries might like have an issue. I don't think they actually did. I think it was just done proactively as a concern. So, um, I, w I have my own personal example of something going rogue. For a long time, we had the dumpling emoji, and we specifically gave the image being like of empanada and pierogi-ish, you know, sort of like the crescent shape. And then like Facebook randomly did like a shaolong bao, like a soup dumpling style, like the little round one, which like by itself, like even though the guidance image was not that, even though like the keywords included like empanada and pierogi, it was, I literally think it was like some Facebook <laughs> Uh, designer who like went rogue because they like soup dumplings and I actually spent <laughs> so much time lobbying each and every like Facebook person in the like emoji hierarchy trying to get them to switch and they finally did so that was that was my little like impact and trying to get the consistency of all the um, those images together more questions yes so it seems like you're talking about two different things one is the platform that is the operating system that's using Unicode and mm -hmm. emoji Yes. Like Facebook, or I just look on WhatsApp, and at least on my version, I don't have any dumplings. You and should. You sh oh, I don't know how old your phone is, but you should. Yeah. You should have. I haven't updated in a while, but it's like years. Recent. Really? Yeah. I mean, not that long. You should. Well, dumpling came in 2017, so I will find you your dumpling on your WhatsApp. I'm, I know. I know. For so WhatsApp does have its own. Yeah. My question, which is, uh huh. Uh, it was WhatsApp doing whatever it likes, and the platform is. Yeah, so, so you will have very different versions of um, emoji depending on the platform. So a good example is Twitter. Uh, there's Twitter web emoji. Twitter web is actually sometimes the first time, the first, the, the first to market because they can just roll it out on the web. And that, those will override whatever operating system you generally are sitting on. Um, you know, that being said, the, I think a long time Apple used, uh, Facebook used to just default to the local operating system and then for a bunch of like competitive reasons and consistency reasons across like you know around the world, they wanted their own set of emoji, and then they override whatever the local operating system is. But um, in, so yeah, like that's why all the more important that they should be at least somewhat consistent in their look. And WhatsApp, WhatsApp is kind of interesting. They're the most rogue of all of the uh, 
the, the platforms because they'll just like kind of go out there and do something. So they were the first to implement both Texas flag emoji, like you know, and then um, and then uh, transgender flag emoji. So which is nice because there was like this big debate about like the transgender flag is it really the you know, a stable flag, even though it's less than 20 years old. And like, you know, WhatsApp was like, we're just gonna do it. And so they just they just introduced it and all forced the hand of all the other operators. And um, so you give WhatsApp, I don't know who they are, you know, whatever like little rogue emoji um, kind of posse there is inside the organization. But I give them credit for being like fearless and like going out there on that. But yes, all, they, they vary. It's like, and it just kind of depends on, you know, what, what uh, what setting you know the apps have in terms of overriding? Yes. How conscious is the community of passing emojis that have like double non-intended meanings? Like for example, um, the emoji that's like the pointer finger like this. Like yeah. What does it mean? I don't even know. Oh, but there just is a middle finger. Yes, is it a middle finger? there is a middle finger emoji. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks to Michael. Thanks to the Irish contingent on the um, international standards organization. That guy who passed it also is the one who came gave us the Vulcan hands, the Vulcan signal. Um, the so this, the more general question is how how conscious is the committee? Of things with a double entendre, they tr they can be as conscious as they can be, given that they are you know we skew like older white engineers plus now a smattering of like Asian women who like and like well, like younger white women who are on the design part of the um, committee. Like sometimes we don't know. Literally, I remember the headlines coming out like earlier this year, and it was like Unicode has passed a tiny penis emoji, and I was like what the hell are they talking about? And I was literally thinking, I'm like, oyster? Like, what did we pass? And it turns out that there, we like passed this thing that was like, like, like pinching, or not pinching, but it's like, you know, very small thing. And like, I honestly, like that came up zero in any of the deliberations. Like we, I, I, I saw, and then, you know, like I emailed the list and I was like, just goes to show, like kinds of, you know, you never anticipate like what people uh, will take an emoji to mean. Um, like right now, like, uh, from what I hear, white, sorry, what I hear, milk is now being used as a symbol for like white nationalism. Like that was also kind of unexpected. So in some ways, what's wonderful about language is that it evolves and it's dynamic and it's grassroots up and it shouldn't be controlled by like, you know, the centralized posse in Silicon Valley. Um, but, you know, we, we, we are conscious about like certain things having connotations like rope emojis coming down the pipeline. There was a lot of debate about like, ugh, like, you know, all the kinds of negative ways that rope can be used in contacts and how different cultures might react differently to to rope emoji. So in as much as like, you know, this small posse of people can debate, there's also, we also put the emoji out for comment at a certain point and people will come back with thoughts for things that we didn't know as well. So, anyway, yes. Um, uh, so I have a question about how do you deal with the fact that most of the people who are on this board are probably American, uh, other than online, and there's a couple of others. Yeah. So for example, when you have uh, s some international food that might not be, that might be specific to a certain region. Yes. It's very frequent. In that there, region. But it's not frequent elsewhere. Right. Like mate like emoji. Food, for example. Yes. Uh, how do you deal with that? Like as a, as a, as yeah. a, as a, as, as a board, person, yes. So this is an issue, yes. This yeah, is an and issue. And another question is, like, why is it that it is uh, this committee that has the power to choose what emojis we can have access to? <coughs> right. Like, who gives you, <coughs> as a committee, the, the right? Right, right. Like, this is a big question in tech in general. Right, right. So, so two questions. It's like, what about all the foods from parts of the world that get, like, are not recognized by, like, people who sit in a room in... Mountain View, California, <coughs> or sometimes Sunnyvale, sometimes Cupertino, um, sometimes San Jose, <laughs> but essentially mostly Silicon Valley. Uh, so that first question is, yeah, that's an issue. This is like I spend a lot of time like fighting for more representative foods. Like I would really like fufu, which is like uh, you know the the big kind of like a carbohydrate like ball of yellow stuff, white stuff. Um, in Africa, but it, it it's not it's not like it's super recognized by uh, people sitting in that room, and so you have to like spend all this time trying to convince them. I remember Arepa. We just passed Arepa. Like I I honestly like 
kind of had to like go to the mat for this rape because you're like, ah, like it doesn't like, I don't recognize it. I'm like, you don't recognize it, but trust me, like, like people who see this will know that it's a rapa, you know, to the point where there's even an ASCII kind of like symbol for rapa, which is like, you know, um, parentheses slash slash close parentheses. And that is, is locally how they can like signal to someone I want to a rapa. And I'm like, if they can do that through ASCII, clearly it means something to them. So it's, it's a lot of, it's a, it's a lot of battles um, in, in our little, you know, C-SPAN level discussions um, of emoji. So then the second question is, why is Unicode the one who are encoding these emoji? And like, you know, all the kind of moral implications that come with that. So they come, it came to Unicode because Unicode is very good at standardizing. And it standardizes across the major platforms like um, Microsoft and Apple and, um, Google being the major ones. I mean, there are some other ones in there, but those are the three major ones. And so they are, they they standardize things. And so they were the ones who standardized these. Whether or not they should continue to standardize, probably consensus is no. Uh, but where does it go next? And like, who else would do it? You know, is there a process to sort of like decentralize it? That is all uh, active debate. I mean, I can trust, you know, the old schoolers in Unicode don't love these debates about, should we have skin tones on, you know, Vampires, like that is not a debate they want to have. Like, they care uh, sometimes more about the you know, coding of minority languages uh, around the world and you know, trying to preserve cultural heritage. So, but it's just the way that it evolved. You know, we can do what we can in that. Ta-da, more questions? Should we go? Okay, I don't even know how the live stream works. So like, we can just keep on going, but why, why don't we just keep on going? Um, thank you so much, this is absolutely fascinating. fascinating. I was wondering, what struck me, and I was curious, is that um, in Unicode, there doesn't seem to be any Japanese representation. So um, much Japanese representation. Although no? Unicode has come, the, the, the emoji origi originated there. Yes, so much so, Japanese representation. I mean, there's like all the holidays, a lot of the foods, oh, no, love hotel. On the committee itself. Oh, on the committee um, itself. And is that yeah. there are global corporations, and therefore um, it's assumed I see. that, that that therefore, through that corporation, um, I see. Japan would have some kind of influence? I don't, it's like partially, okay, so why are there not Japanese people on the committee? So one, a lot of the, Jap there's not Japanese companies on the committee. That being said, one of the original proposers of um, the, unique, the sort of emoji set was a man named Kat Momoi, who is Japanese, Japanese, like Japanese American probably at this point. Um, and a lot of the other people who are active, especially from the from the Google side, their internationalization team is very international. Um, they show up every so once in a while. I mean, like the whole like bean debate came from the desire to have a soybean. Um, and I think in general, it's like who can show up four times a year in that room? Like I just happen to be able to do that because I, you know, I have a career that allows me to be flexible, but it is a lot of time and it's very, very far uh, for many people to travel. Um, and I think on some level, like Japan isn't super into, like they did their thing with emoji to kind of put it down to the world and they're pretty well representative. So it's not like they have to like go and fight, you know, for like the, onigiri emoji or anything like that. So that's kind of, I think that's kind of my take. And also like if they're going to pick their battles, they, they, they tend to pick it over the encoding, the actual like kanji, uh, uh, you know, hiragana, katakana kind of stuff. It's like, eh, about this. That's kind of my take. I mean, I might be like generalizing, but I, I don't, I, we haven't like had like these fervent battles with Japanese folks on emoji, I would say. Ta-da, are we good? Are we done? One more. <laughs> No worries. I mean, I think we've all kind of seen those posts where someone's like, my dad just died crying emoji. Yeah. Or maybe your mom inappropriately used a poem. Yeah. We've really talked about it. Before. Yeah. Do you think one day that um, many of the, the apps will have maybe a spell check or grammar check for emojis? Yeah. yeah. So the question is like inappropriate use of emojis and whether or not the, um, the apps will one day have a spell check or grammar check. I do think that one thing is that emoji usage tends to be very localized in terms of like you you have like little dialects emerge so like we have the US dialect but that is different from how they use the emoji in like Japan or China which is very very different right they are mostly in sort of a closed uh, WeChat uh, sticker world and maybe different from France and so so you know like a very interesting example is like now the peach has 
involved as a symbol of impeachment, right? Or use of peach and the little herb thing for peach mint. But that's very specific to like an English sort of rebus construction. So um, what is my take on it? I don't know. Okay, I would say that the apps will suggest things. I don't know if they'll, they'll like do the little red squiggle underneath any time in the near future, like maybe in like 10 years or so. But I feel like at this point, we're, there's, everyone's still just trying to figure out like how do you get the emoji on as opposed to like trying to prevent people from saying like, like bad things. And it's very funny because I actually was just at, I just gave a session, a big lecture where literally like someone who was like a total adult in the class had no idea what the eggplant emoji meant, you know, and, and we're like, where have you been <laughs> for the last like five or six years? Um, but I think it, it's, it is kind of interesting to see like all these connotations like hop on and off um, different emojis. Like one of the interesting examples is the peach emoji. At a certain point a couple years ago, Apple updated it to be less butt-like. And then there were like protests, like howls and howls of protest um, during the beta kind of rollout. And then like to their credit, they flipped it back. <laughs> so now you have your peach emoji just like you want it. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think I think that's a good way to leave the lecture.